warning, this podcast talks about explicit content. Please know that there may be trigger warnings and parental discretion is advised. Well, hello everyone. This is Kimmy, and I welcome you to the very first episode of the Always Talking Crime podcast. I decided to start this podcast because honestly, I'm truly, truly obsessed with all things true crime. And I was excited to start a podcast of my own. I've been listening to so many different podcasts in podcasters in probably the last six months. And I wanted to give a shout out to some of my favorites because I just want to let you guys know if these podcasters end up kind of um, running across mine and they ever give it a listen, I want them to know how inspiring they have been to me and um, it really motivated me to start a podcast of my own. And secondly, if any of my listeners are looking for more podcasts like this one, um, these are ones that I would recommend you listen to in between um, new releases of my own episodes. So first and foremost, the very first true crime podcast that I began to listen to was My Favorite Murder, and it was actually recommended to me by a friend of mine that has actually been my hairdresser for about 10 years now. So that's the one I started with. It's hilarious. Um, They do some really amazing cases, and they've been around for years. So there's a lot of um, recordings already right there for you to listen to. After that, I ended up running across um, Murder With My Husband. And I love Murder With My Husband because it's a married couple. I think they live in Utah. And the wife loves true crime, just like me. And the husband hates it. So she tells him a different true crime case every episode. And he kind of ask questions but he like literally knows nothing about the cases before it starts recording um i also started to listen to um morbid which is another true crime podcast and yesterday i came across two other ones and i i gave a couple of their episodes a listen Crimes and Cocktails, that was really fun, and Wicked Minds, a dark podcast. So those are all on Spotify, and um, I would recommend you giving them a listen. Like I said, don't skip my podcast because my podcast is going to be awesome. (laughs) But in case you guys are looking for more, um, those are some great recommendations. So I decided that my very first episode is going to be about Florida's Black Widow. Her name, when you say it in English, is Judy Bonanno. And she was actually born um, Judy or Judias Welty. So she was born in um, 1943, April 4th. 1943, as a matter of fact, and she was born in Texas. She was the daughter of a farm laborer. She was of Latina ethnic background, um, and apparently Judy described her mother as a member of this non-existent Mesquite Apache tribe. (laughs) And her and her mom were not close. In fact, her mom, who was also named Judy or Judius, um, she actually passed away when Judy was only two years old. I get some conflicting information, like when I was doing research um, on this case, 
some articles said that Judy was two years old or just under two years old, and there were a couple that said that she was four years old, but whatever the case, Judy's mother passed away when she was quite young. There were actually four children. Um, Judy had two older siblings, and then she also had an infant brother named Robert. And when the mother passed away, um, the two older kids, for whatever reason, I don't really understand why, but the two older kids were put up for adoption. And Judy and her baby brother Robert were sent to live with their grandparents. Eventually, Judy's father remarried and took Judy and Robert to live with him and his new wife in Roswell, New Mexico. Judy was miserable there and claimed that both her father and stepmother abused her. Um, She said that she was beaten, she was starved, she was forced to work long hours as a virtual slave. Um, You know, these were all, you know, things that allegedly happened. It was never proved that anything was really going on. Um, That doesn't mean that it wasn't either. Um, It just sounds like she had a pretty shitty upbringing. Um, It was hardly ideal for an adolescent girl. Her family eventually pushed her too far, and when she was 14 years old, she was sentenced to two months in prison for attacking them and her two stepbrothers. So I think, um, if memory serves, I think she had three or four stepbrothers when her dad remarried, and then, of course, she had her younger brother. So she was the only girl. So I imagine that if the parents were abusive to her, like the stepbrothers, I would assume, may also have been abusive to her. Um, You know, there's no telling for sure. But she freaked out. Um, I heard something about her throwing hot grease at her two of her stepbrothers. I'm not sure if that's actually you know, what she did, but at any rate, she ended up being in prison, um, at least, like, for juveniles for two months. Um, So the judge, you know, was going to offer to let her go home when she was released, but she chose to go to a reform school instead of back to her abusive family. So she went um, to the Foothills High School in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and she graduated when she was 16 years old in 1959. Not surprisingly, she had a really poor view of her family, and it's been reported that she said about her younger brother, Robert, I wouldn't spit down his throat if his guts were on fire. So there was obviously a lot of bad feelings between her and her family, not just her step family and her stepmother and her step siblings, but you know, her real, um, her, her blood brother as well. So Judy started working her first job in 1960. She was employed as a nursing assistant in Roswell under the assumed name of Anna Schultz. So for whatever reason, she changed her name from Judy Welty to Anna Schultz. In 1961, she gave birth to an illegitimate son who she named Michael Schultz. She reaffirmed to or she refused to confirm rumors that his father was a pilot from the nearby um, Air Force Base. So nobody ever knew who little Michael's father really was. She married for the first time on January 21st, 1962. So a year after she gave birth to her first son, she married a man named James Goodyear, who was an Air Force officer. And then Judy gave birth to their first child, James Jr., in January of 1966. I also wanted to point out that James Goodyear adopted Michael. So they had two sons. And then in 1967, she gave birth to a daughter named Kimberly, which I might say is an amazing name because your favorite true crime podcaster's name is also Kimberly. (laughs) But um, anyways, they were now living in Orlando, Florida. So that must be where he was stationed. 
1968, Judy opened up her first business. So now they're like calling her Judy again. So for whatever reason, when she got her first job and had her illegitimate baby, she was going by the name Anna Schultz. But now she's going back to the name Judy. So now she's Judy Goodyear and she's opening up her own business, her first business. It was called the Conway Acres Child Care Center. It was located in Orlando and it had the financial backing of her husband, which, you know, was awesome for her that her husband was helping her start her first business. And it sounds like he was like super supportive of her. So James Goodyear Sr. had done a tour of duty in Vietnam And three months after his return home, he was admitted to the U.S. Naval Hospital in Orlando. He was suffering from some mysterious symptoms. Um, Nobody could kind of figure out what was going on with him. But he died shortly after, on September 15th, 1971. And this is really fucking weird, guys. But Judy not only cashed in one life insurance policy, but she cashed in three life insurance policies. And it's been rumored that she like waited five days, quietly waited five days, and then she cashed in all three life insurance policies. So towards the end of that same year, Judy suffered a house fire at her home And she received another $90,000 from the insurers, you know, for the home. Now, it didn't take long for Judy to find a new boyfriend. And that's kind of um, suspect because I heard that Judy was a pretty unattractive woman. And I'm going to be posting on social media, on my Instagram, some photos of Judy. So you guys can see for yourself. And, and this article was right. Like she, she was not attractive. In fact, some people said she was downright ugly, which is not kind, but you know, it might not be wrong. (laughs) But, um, she obviously made the most of what she had because it wasn't, soon after her husband passed away and and she cashed in those insurance policies, but she had a new boyfriend. Didn't take her long at all. So this girl knows how to bounce back quickly. So her boyfriend's name was Bobby Joe Morris, (laughs) who lived in Pensacola. And honestly, guys, the reason why I chose this case to be the first case is because when I was researching and trying to decide which one to do first, as soon as I saw Pensacola in the story, I live in Pensacola. Just an FYI, in case you don't know me personally and you just ran ran across this podcast, I have lived in Pensacola since 2009. Love it here. I'm from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan originally, but my ex-husband was in the U.S. Navy. So this was his last duty station before he got out of the Navy. And when we split up, I just stayed here because I love it. If I ever leave, it's because I go farther south in Florida. But for the most part, it's a great area. So this is where she ended up living with Bobby Joe Morris. She moved in with him in 1972. So they never got married, reportedly. um, But I guess that they were considered, you know, common law spouses. I'm not really sure how long somebody has to be with someone um, to be considered common law. But anyways, um, they were in a relationship together. Um, The only thing that was wrong was with her new life was her son, Michael. Um, so Michael is the illegitimate son, the one that she had that nobody knew who her his real father was. So Michael was super disruptive at school and reportedly of low intelligence. She was able to get him into a residential foster care for a time. And then Bobby Morris moved to Colorado in 1977 and invited Judy and you know her kids to follow him. So they joined him a little bit later, 
Before she left Pensacola, though, um, she was the victim of another house fire. Suspect. (laughs) Which brought another insurance payout. And soon after she moved to Colorado, Bobby Joe became ill and he was admitted to the hospital. So in 1978, so not very long after she moved there with her kids, Bobby Joe got ill, became ill. So again, just like her husband, the cause of his illness was a mystery. So the doctors couldn't figure it out and he was soon discharged. But two days later, after he went home from the hospital, he collapsed and was taken back to the hospital where he died. He died two days later. Once again, Judy benefited from the life insurance policies taken out on his life. So reportedly, she had another three life insurance policies on Bobby Joe Morris. And I don't know if they had life insurance policies on her, but she certainly did not shy away from putting life insurance policies on the men in her life. And in fact, I know I heard on some other podcast episodes, on the other podcasts I mentioned, anything talking about her, the people or the podcasters weren't really, they didn't know anything about life insurance. So they seemed kind of puzzled about how somebody could have three life insurance policies. Um, And I guess like right now at my job, my J-O-B, I do have a small life insurance policy that the company pays for. It's only $25,000. So it would pay, you know, for my funeral expenses and all that kind of stuff. And then I also personally have a larger life insurance policy that um, my son and my mother are beneficiaries for. But um, I am also a licensed life insurance. So I had to pause for a minute because I was like, what was I going to say? Sometimes I do that. (laughs) Just warning you now, you guys are in for a bumpy, bumpy ride. So, um, So I am a licensed life insurance agent in the state of Florida, and I have been since 2013. So... People can get more than one life insurance policy and you can get a life insurance policy on a boyfriend. Like if you've been together, if you um, share the same household, like what is that called? Like domesticated partnerships, you do have an insurable interest and you are able to get more than one policy, not usually if it's um, the same insurance the same insurance um, company because they're going to wonder why you need more than one policy unless you put on there that it's for estate planning purposes and each policy has different beneficiaries. So if I wanted to open up another life insurance policy for myself with the same company that I have one already, I could do that provided I have different beneficiaries than I do on the policy that already exists. Um, But she could have just gone to an entirely different life insurance company. Or another thing I was thinking is my credit union always sends me applications where I'm already like pre-approved for X amount of dollars of life insurance that they're going to pay for. And if I want to add more, you know, I can. So one of the life insurance policies could have very well been something like that, you know, because everybody's been really confused, like, how'd this fucking bitch get so much life insurance and how'd she get three policies on all of these guys? So it's probably something like that, I'm guessing. But anyways, once again, Miss Judy benefited from life insurance policies. So it seems like men dying and her cashing in on life insurance policies um, seem to be a um, a really good um, type of, financial gain for her. It was almost like a job, right? (laughs) Who has to fucking work when you can just collect life insurance policies on people? So it's highly, highly suspect, okay? Um, I did want to mention, because her name in English pronunciation is Judy Bonono, but she claimed that... um, 
Okay, so she changed her name to Judy Bonono from Goodyear because she claimed that in Spanish, because, you know, she did have Latina ethnicity, she claimed that Bonono was Goodyear, but in Spanish. But the fucking hilarious thing about this entire story, the thing that made me laugh out loud (laughs) to myself was the fact that Bonono doesn't stand for good year. It stands for good anus in Spanish because she left out the little enunciation over the N. Now, I don't speak Spanish, so this is just like what I researched. If she would have pronounced it Judy Benano, Benano, yeah, Benano, if she would have like put in that little pronunciation, then it would have been good year. And if you speak Spanish and I just massacred that, I apologize, but that's just the difference. So she didn't put that little enunciation there. So instead of good year, so instead of being Judy good year, Benano, she's Benano, and that means good anus. So apparently, um, she thought she had a really good um, butthole, <laughs> which is so fucking hilarious to me. So, which as you learn more about her, as I continue to talk to her, you're going to be like, yeah, she was just a big butthole. So that was like the perfect, perfect fucking name for this bitch. All right. So Bobby Joe Morris was dead, um, but his family suspected that he had been murdered and he was not only he was not the only victim okay so before he died in 1978 there was a conversation between Bobby Joe and Judy that had been overheard by Bobby Joe's mom so in 1974 they had been visiting Bobby Joe's family in his hometown of Bruton, Alabama, which is not far from here. And I have a wonderful friend named Kim that lives in Bruton, Alabama right now. So shout out to my Bruton, Alabama peeps if you're listening. I actually know many people that either live in Bruton or have lived in Bruton um, in the past. So it was kind of funny. So I love that this story takes place or this case takes place in places that I am familiar with. This is super cool. But anyways, they were visiting, and um, there was a man, a man that was a resident of Florida that had been found dead in a motel room. So I do want to point out that Pensacola is about 45 minutes away from the Alabama state line. So It's not unheard of at all for a person in Florida to be in Alabama frequently or vice versa. But this guy was found dead in a hotel room in Bruton, Alabama. So the local police, they received an anonymous phone call. And it was traced to a a local payphone, which led them to the motel room where the dead body of the man was found. He had been shot in the chest and he had had his throat cut. That's the creepiest thing. Like, whenever, like, somebody's throat gets cut or slashed, like, on a horror movie, like, to me, that's, like, just the worst thing. And maybe it's the sound effect that goes with it on the movies, but that always, like, gives me the creeps when somebody has their throat cut. So, it's claimed that Bobby Joe's mom overheard Judy telling Bobby Joe that son of a bitch shouldn't have come up here in the first place. He knew if he came here, he was going to die. So this was about four years before Bobby Joe passed away. You know, um, suddenly and suspiciously, nobody knowing why or how or what was wrong with him. So when Bobby Joe was in the hospital dying, I guess that he had confessed to his part in this killing like on his deathbed. But at the time, you know, when when the body was found, the police couldn't find any fingerprints inside the room and there wasn't any bullet that was ever recovered from the corpse. So they didn't have enough 
evidence to bring charges against anyone, you know, but here he was, here was Bobby Joe, you know, admitting that he had a part. And I guess that he was telling Judy, you know, that they had, they should have never done that. Like he, he felt remorse that they had killed this man. So no other, no other information, um, I can't find more information about who this guy was at all. Um, but I'm led to believe that possibly it was somebody that maybe Judy had cheated on um, on Bobby at one time. Um, Bobby Joe, you know, he did leave for Colorado, you know, without the family for a while. So I'm thinking it's possible that, you know, Judy being that hot, sexy woman that she is, somehow managed, you know, to get another man, you know, another man's interest. And maybe she cheated and maybe he was like stalking her, following her. Who really knows? Like I've been the subject of some crazy ass men that just couldn't let go or just stalked me and followed me. Um, and it's so much easier nowadays on social media. I'm kind of going through that right now with some weird guy that I know from my past. But, um, you know, like I said, it was probably something like that, but nothing was ever exposed about who that man was. So this was the time um, right after Bobby Joe's death that, that Judy legally changed her name and, um, you know, she thought it meant good year, but it was actually good butthole. <laughs> good anus. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So this was an apparent tribute to her late husband. Um, she and her family moved back to Pensacola. And Michael, her first child, Michael Good Butthole, <laughs> as he had now become, had done badly in school, and he had joined the Navy. So this was in June 1979. So again, like, I'm not really sure how he was able to enlist in the military. Maybe, um, I don't know, because I thought that you had to, like, take certain tests and, you know, be qualified, you know, but he had done poorly. He was supposedly of, like, low intelligence, all that kind of stuff. But somehow he got into the, into the Army, and he was based soon after in Georgia. Not long after, he started to show signs of illness and was diagnosed as suffering. Get this, guys. He was suffering from arsenic poisoning, which rapidly affected his upper and lower limbs. So all of his arms and legs like were, were super affected by being poisoned with arsenic. So he was given heavy metal leg braces from the military hospital and discharged from the army. He was discharged into the care of his mother, um, unable to walk or use his arms. So he was like 5,000% reliant on his mother to take care of him all right guys so this is where it gets super super dark and crazy on may 13th 1980 judy took michael and his younger brother james canoeing on the east river in pensacola so here michael has metal braces on his legs and it's been reported that these braces weighed approximately 15 pounds. So they were heavy. Um, but he duct taped Michael to a lawn chair and put the lawn chair in the fucking canoe with Michael on it. So, yeah, that seems crazy. It does not seem like a good idea. It doesn't seem like anything that a mother would do if she truly cared about her son. And as you guys, you know, probably already suspect, something bad happened because the canoe capsized. James, the younger brother, and Judy were able to get out from under the upturned canoe but Michael, since he was weighed down by the heavy braces, didn't stand a chance, and of course, he drowned. 
So the police accepted Judy's account of what happened, but the Army investigators were not so easily taken in. Judy received $20,000 from Michael's military life insurance policy, but the sheriff's officers began taking interest in the case when it was discovered that there were also two other civilian policies on Michael's life. So again, there were three life insurance policies. It was suggested by the handwriting experts that Michael's signatures on the life insurance applications may have been forged. But then again, I mean, as a parent of a child, a parent does have an insurable interest on her child. So she may have um, pretended, maybe she put it like Michael was getting his own policy and naming his mom as the beneficiary. But at that age, since Michael, you know, was under 25 years of age, she could have legally gotten life insurance policies on her son anyways because it has to either be a child um, or a parent or a spouse. So, like, you cannot go and put life insurance policies on a sibling of yours or an aunt or an uncle, but you can definitely do it on a child or a parent or a spouse or a domestic partner. So um, I'm not sure about the details on that. but um, So after Michael's death, you guys... Judy used that money to open a beauty salon in Gulf Breeze, Florida, which I'm sitting in my house right now, um, and it literally takes me about five minutes to drive across the Three Mile Bridge and get to Gulf Breeze, Florida, which is super cool. But anyways, she opened up this business, so this was her second business, a beauty salon in Gulf Breeze. Um, and she also began seeing a Pensacola businessman named John Gentry II. She told John Gentry that she had various bogus qualifications. So apparently, like, he was super successful and she just probably started lying about, you know, her qualifications and her background. But um, she had bragged that she had a master's degree and she had worked as a senior nurse in Florida um, blah, 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 blah. So, I mean, she did have, um, a nursing assistant background from, you know, when she first gave birth to Michael, um, who is now deceased, but, you know, when he was first illegitimate, that's, you know, that's what she did. But in all the years since, like, she did not work, in the medical field, she did not have a master's degree, and she certainly was not a senior nurse, because there's a huge difference between being a senior nurse and being a nursing assistant, but anyways, and aren't there like a bunch of boards and everything that you have to pass, so even if she was a nursing assistant in New Mexico, I don't know a lot about the medical field, but I'm pretty sure that you have to pass some kind of exam or boards or something to practice um, as a nurse in a different state. So maybe I'm wrong, but I know like if you're a hairdresser or something and you move to a different state, you have to qualify all over again with like credits and education and all that kind of stuff. So why wouldn't you have to in the medical field? I don't know. So that part's kind of like weird, but anyways, she was lying and he never called her on her bullshit. So she persuaded John Gentry II to take out life insurance policies on each other in October of 1982. So they both got life insurance policies on each other in the amount of $50,000, which isn't a law, and it really probably wasn't even a law in 1982. But what Judy later did is she went behind um, John Gentry's back and increased the size of the policy on him from $50,000 to $500,000. And she was probably paying the difference in the premium, so he probably never even realized it. She also persuaded him to start taking vitamin capsules which 
he reported that they made him like super nauseous and dizzy. And when he complained about these effects, these side effects, Judy allegedly told him, oh, well, no, no worry. You just need to double up your dose. (laughs) So when, if something makes you feel sick to your stomach, why would you take twice as much? Because it seems like you'd have twice as much of the side effects. Am I right? But he probably thought, oh, yeah, she's got this master's degree and she's a senior nurse. You know, she's been a senior nurse. So, you know, this woman knows what she's talking about. So I'll just go ahead and start doubling my dosage on my um, creepy ass vitamins. (laughs) So it's more and more apparent that this woman is a good booty hole, isn't she? Because she is a butthole of a person. And I wouldn't even say human being. I was just about to say, you know, a butthole of a human being. But she doesn't even sound like she's human to me. So let me keep going on here because it gets crazier and crazier. On June 25th, 1983... Judy announced to John Gentry that she was pregnant. And she told John, um, and I guess he was excited because he went out to get some champagne so that they could celebrate, which is fucking weird because if you're pregnant, you know, you probably shouldn't be drinking alcohol. But, you know, again, this is in the 80s and, you know, they probably weren't thinking like, ooh, maybe she should drink something non-alcoholic to celebrate her pregnancy. Um, but okay, guys, when John Chantry started his car to go get the champagne, a fucking bomb exploded, a, a car bomb exploded. So somebody set a car bomb on his vehicle. And I wonder who that could have been. He was seriously injured as a result. Four days later, he was well enough to answer questions when the police came to talk to him, which led them to examine Judy's background in minute detail. So they found like so many inconsistencies between what John thought was the case and what the police found out to be really true. Um, So Judy had no medical qualifications. She was never pregnant and had actually um, had been sterilized. So she went and got her tubes tied years previously, and John Gentry didn't even know this. So she was outright lying. She was a lying motherfucker about being pregnant. She was obviously, you know, just trying to trap him into getting married or, you know, whatever. Because if he was, like, super successful or whatever, you know, she was probably thinking, oh, yeah, you know, then... When he dies in a, you know, however he's going to die, then I'm going to get more money. But anyways, um, she was not pregnant. And she had booked a cruise for herself and her two children not long after they purchased the life insurance policies and right before the car bomb exploded and injured John and she did not buy a ticket on this cruise for John it was just her and her kids so yeah yeah that is highly highly suspect she also recently had become had started to tell her friends that John had a terminal illness which was not true several of the alleged vitamin capsules were recovered by police, and they were found to contain um, the arsenic. Yeah, so they had, no, they had some kind of formaldehyde, another thing reported. You know, so it was either, I don't know, is arsenic like a formaldehyde? I'm not really sure. But anyways, this report that I'm reading right now um, talks about it being like arsenic. So at this stage, however, there wasn't enough evidence. It wasn't sufficient to charge Judy with attempted murder. A later search of Judy's house revealed wire and tape in her bedroom, which matched the remains of the wire and tape that were found on the bomb in John's car. 
After that, the police also traced the source of the dynamite and were able to link Judy through telephone records. So I don't know where the fuck she bought this dynamite. Um, I always think of like Roadrunner and Wile Wile E. Coyote (laughs) whenever like the subject of dynamite comes up. Because, or I think of like Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck, like dynamite goes off and like Daffy Duck's um, beak explodes off or like it falls on the ground and he has to pick it back up and put it back on his face. (laughs) But anyways, um, yeah, so they found that um, Judy had purchased dynamite. She was arrested, Judy was arrested and she was out on bail on the charge of attempted murder of John Gentry II. But not long after, she was arrested again and um, charged with first-degree murder in respect of Michael's death. Okay, so she was out on bail in the attempted murder of John Gentry. But then she was rearrested, but this time charged with first-degree murder of her son from that canoe incident. In February, like a month after she'd been arrested, the body of Bobby Joe Morris was exhumed. And guess what, guys? They found arsenic. They also exhumed the body of James Goodyear, her ex-husband, and found arsenic in that body. So, Judy was tried separately for each murder and for the attempted murder. She was sentenced to life imprisonment without parole for the first 25 years for Michael's murder. So, this was for her son's murder. Surprisingly, though, she was acquitted of the charge for attempted murder on John Gentry, but she was found guilty of first-degree murder in the case of her first husband, James Goodyear. So she was found guilty for murdering her son. She was acquitted for the car bomb incident, but then she was also um, found guilty of murdering her husband. The jury deliberated for 10 and a half hours, and for this, she was sentenced to death by electrocution. She was sentenced to death on November 26th of 1985. Colorado prosecutors, okay, so all of this was going on in Florida, but the Colorado prosecutors decided not to continue with the case against her for the murder of Bobby Joe Morris, even though they found arsenic in his body when they exhumed his body, um, because she was already under the death sentence in Florida anyways, and she was never going to get out alive. So they just figured um, they just figured they would let that go, apparently, which kind of sucks for Bobby Joe Morris's family. I mean, they know she did it, but if if I was... Like, if somebody murdered my child, my son, and they knew who it was, but they decided not to press charges, I would still want them to press charges just to have closure. That's just me. But I would still, I would still want justice. Um, so it is estimated that she collected around $240,000 in insurance money from the deaths of her husband, son, and boyfriend. And then don't forget about the $90,000 that she got from the first house fire. And it was never disclosed how much she got for that second house fire. So she like $240,000, like a half a million or a quarter of a million dollars is a lot of money, but it's not a lot of money. Like it's not a lot of money when it means that, you know, you have to kill two people or two people in your life close to you die. You know, there's, There's not enough money in the world. There's no price tag for my child. There's there's no amount of money that would ever be enough. So, and if I was married, I would feel the same way about my spouse. Like, there's no amount of money. Like, of course, you know, I would want to have a life insurance policy on my spouse and vice versa. 
you know, just because if you're a two income family and you have a mortgage or rent and bills, like, you know, those bills don't go away or half the bills don't go away just because your spouse passes away. So insurance is important, but at the same time, there's not a price tag that you can put on a person that you love. So anyways, um, Judy butthole, (laughs) Judy good butthole was on death row. Um, she was to spend the next 13 years on death row. She continued to appeal. Um, she had three death warrants handed down over the years. So she spent her time confined in a six by nine foot cell. I guess it was nine and a half feet high. Um, So they were served meals three times a day. She'd get to eat at 5 a.m., then 10.30 a.m., and then again at like 4.30 p.m. So I'm surprised nobody ever poisoned her. (laughs) You know what I mean? Um, They're allowed plates and spoons to eat their meals. Visitors are allowed every weekend when you're on death row from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And I know that her daughter, Kimberly, um, Kimberly visited her, visited her quite a bit from my understanding. They're allowed to get mail all the time. And, and, um, so her daughter actually did a lot to fight against the death being by electrocution, by electric chair. Um, she was trying, you know, she understood, you know, her mom's sentence Um, So she wasn't fighting the sentence, but she was fighting the way her mother was going to be executed. She was trying to get her mother's execution to be done by lethal injection. Judy was actually the first woman that was executed in Florida for 150 years. So the person that had been executed, the woman that had been executed in Florida before her was a black slave named Celia. She was hanged for stabbing her owner to death in 1848. So Judy was only the third woman executed in the whole United States since the death penalty was reinstated in 1976. So... Although her daughter Kimberly was trying to get her death to be by lethal injection instead of the electric chair, um, you know, they like lit up old Sparky, <laughs> which was what the, um, the electric chair was named because I guess um, she had gotten a short stay of execution previously because there was something wrong with old Sparky. So the electric chair had reportedly like burn someone's like skin like like right off when they had executed you know someone else previously so old sparky was apparently getting fixed um this was florida's electric chair um so she tried to face her death with some stoic dignity um she tried to be strong. Um, she never, ever admitted to killing anyone. She denied, she denied, she denied until the very end. So the guards, you know, picked her up from her cell after she had had her, her last meal. Um, and you know, like when you're on death row, and it's the night before your execution, did you know that you can literally choose anything in the fucking world that you want to eat as your last meal? And I can think of so much good food. And maybe you'd be, like, super upset that you wouldn't even be able to eat because you'd be nervous or, like, scared of dying or, you know, any of these things that, you know, make sense. But this is what she fucking chose. Her final meal was asparagus, broccoli, tomatoes, strawberries, and hot tea. Isn't that weird? Like, why the fuck would you choose those things? Unless, like, she was afraid that she was, like, going to shit as soon as she got electrocuted. Because I know that so many times when people pass, 
um, like their bowels and everything released. So maybe she was like super concerned with still having her dignity after she was electrocuted. But for whatever reason, um, you know, that's what she chose. So um, she had had her her hair freshly shaven. Um, there was no longer any evidence of her painted manicured nails and her beautiful hair because they shaved it off. Um, there was no longer any evidence of the tough edged woman who once, you know, flew around Pensacola in a Corvette and told bigger than life stories about herself, you know, like always lying and exaggerating the truth. Um, so, Her bald head, her freshly shaven head, had been covered with gel, which that helps to better conduct the electrical current, which just creeps me the fuck out. Um, I guess that she looked more like a frightened little old lady, okay? She hadn't even been like 55 years old yet. She died. She'd been executed when she was 54 years old. But I guess she was like super like quiet and seemed scared. Um, Basically, like when the guards came to get her out of her cell, I guess she clung tightly to their hands as they walked her, you know, towards the death chamber. She was pale and terrified, it's been reported. And yeah... I mean, but she deserves it. But I mean, I can't imagine that feeling. I just can't imagine. It's terrifying to me. But then again, like she boasted to people that, you know, Florida would never execute her. Like she may, you know, be in prison forever, but she was never going to be executed. She would never get the death penalty, you know? So I think it's fucking ha ha. Yeah, bitch. (laughs) I think it's funny that she did get the death penalty and rightly so. Um... So, when she was asked if she had any final words, I guess she replied in a barely audible whisper, no, sir. And moments later, as the current raced through her body, her fists clenched and smoke rose from the electrode attached to her right leg. So, I guess her right leg started, like, smoking, but, like, it didn't light on fire. There were no flames, which is, like, kind of, like, part of the concern that they were having because of old Sparky doing shit like that to people in the past. Um, but by 7.13 a.m., On the morning of Monday, March 30th, 1998, which ironically, that would have been her son Michael's 37th birthday. Judy Bonanno, Bonanno, I don't know how to say her name, butthole, (laughs) anus, good anus. She had become the first woman executed in the state of Florida in 150 years. And the first woman to ever die in the electric chair. So that is the story of that slime ball. Um, The Black Widow, the Black Widow of Florida. Um, I guess that there had been some rumors going around that when when she married Goodyear, when she married her husband and she was living in Orlando, um... I guess that Mr. Goodyear was a really nice man and like nobody ever suspected that when he got sick, it was because he was being poisoned. Nobody really liked Judy, um, the other women in the neighborhood. They said that she seemed strange, um, but they didn't really like her because they accused her of always flirting with their husband. So, which is so weird to me too. I mean, I guess like unattractive women can still be flirty And I guess it's just all about how you present yourself and, you know, how you think about yourself. Because this woman, um, and when you see pictures of her, she is not attractive, nor has she ever been attractive. Um, I don't know how she managed to, you know, get the attention of all these men. And I'm sure, you know, oh my gosh, these poor guys, like hooking up or marrying this woman that's actually a black widow and is gonna like murder you I mean how insane how insane 
But that is the story. I don't have any tears for her. I don't know about you guys. No tears for her. Apparently, um, Kimberly still lives in this area. It's been reported that she lives in Navarre, Florida, which is probably about 45 minutes from my home. And by the reports I've read, I guess she's a server. I don't know if that's still correct. I don't know the age of, I don't know the age of that, um, report that I was reading online, but it did say that she's a server. She's married. She has children. Um, and she doesn't want her children to know or to, to have bad feelings about their grandmother being executed. So she's still reporting to her children, you know, what a great person her mom was. So she was like right there supporting her mom, even though her mom had murdered, had outright like murdered her brother, her older brother. So I don't know. I mean, I guess people can just be in denial. I think there was a time that her mom was um was very supportive of her because apparently years previously when Judy was with Bobby Joe Morris Kimberly had told her that Bobby Joe was abusing her sexually and that may have caused them, you know, to split up or maybe that's one of the reasons why Judy decided to start poisoning. I mean, I really feel like Judy or Judy would have started poisoning Brian anyway, or Bobby Joe. <laughs> Bobby Joe, um, yeah, she would have started poisoning this man anyway, but maybe she started doing it more quickly because it's been reported. Not ever really confirmed, but I guess Kimberly was saying that... Um, you know, she was being sexually abused. So I guess we'll never, ever really know. But maybe that makes sense. And that's why she stood by her mom's side the entire time. And I guess that when she was on death death row, Judy would um, be knitting baby items, like baby clothes and everything. And then Kimberly would sell them online, which is weird. Like, I guess there's people out there that would buy that shit, especially if they knew it was from a murderer. Like, I never would. That would, like, cause me to not purchase it. (laughs) But I guess there's, you know, different strokes for different folks. But so, yeah, this has been really fun. I hope that you guys have enjoyed my first case. I will put um, the... um, the links to where I got my information and I will also be putting pictures of Judy and you know whatever other pictures that I can find on my Instagram so if you are not following me on Instagram yet I do have an account called the always talking crime podcast so please follow me there Um, please message me if you have any ideas of more awesome cases that I can talk about. I have a big list of things that, you know, I'm I'm going to be doing, but I am going to be adding additional cases um, for people who join my membership down the road. And those are all going to be cases that I'm going to be talking about that are recommended by my listeners. So I'm like super excited about growing this podcast and building a awesome true crime community of people who are obsessed like I am. (laughs) I mean, it's almost kind of weird sometimes. I'm like, okay, I feel kind of awkward because I just literally bring up true crime (laughs) and serial killers all the time. Like I listen to podcasts at work. I'll come home and I'll watch like serial killer documentaries, you know, on Netflix and Hulu and whatever I run across. I'm like, if it's on there... I fucking watch it. I just can't get enough. So (laughs) I know there's a lot of people that are like that as well. So anyways, I appreciate you guys listening. If you could rate my podcast, that would be amazing too, because I know that that is something that can now be done on Spotify. Um, It used to just be on Apple Podcasts, and I'm going to be releasing this to Spotify first, and then it'll be released on Apple Podcasts and other things 
um, as I continued through this journey. But please, where whenever you can, follow me, share my podcast with other true crime enthusiasts, and um, you know, do whatever you can to help support me. I'd really, really appreciate that support from you all. But anyways, guys, until next time, stay obsessed.